Hey guys, welcome to episode 36 of The Green Life. Today's episode is all about adrenal fatigue and we are going to dive really deep into this. But before, big shout out to Nama Well for being the sponsor of this podcast. The Nama J2 juicer is a massive upgrade to my juicing experience and I could never say enough good things about the way that the machine works. Easy to use, easy to clean and the juices are fantastic and you save money because you squeeze every bit of juice out of your produce. So if you want to check out the J2, go to my show notes for 10% off. All right, now we can go back to the episode and introduce my guest today who is Dr. Brad Campbell. Dr. Campbell is a holistic physician, chiropractic internist, and acupuncturist who runs his own clinic in Chicago. Dr. Campbell became a sensation over Instagram in the past two years, talking about positivity and medicine in a way that is empowering for people. And also because he has this beautiful Irish setter called Albus Dumbledore, who is the most beautiful puppy. So his videos were in the car with Albus in the back and we all fell in love with him, the dog. And so I was listening to Dr. Campbell and I love this message. And I saw that he had a book and the book is all about adrenal fatigue, a subject that is huge. And I think we all have to understand a little bit better because so many of us are actually facing this and we don't even know it. So we're going to dive into this, but before, let's just say that Dr. Campbell believes that true medicine is about vitality and longevity and is empowerment of his patients. So he creates this beautiful relationship with all his patients because he really allows them to find the way to be healthy. He doesn't specialize in one side of the body, in one area of health, but he actually looks at the body as this holistic being. And by doing so, he can really help people get to the place they need to be to be healthy long term. This is how I also see health. And so on this basis, I really love having conversation with people that look at health in such a multidimensional way. Okay, without further ado, let's just dive into this beautiful book. Welcome, Dr. Campbell. Hello, Dr. Campbell. So nice to have you on The Green Life today. Thank you so much for making the time. How are you? Doing very well. Yeah, it's awesome. nice and warm here. Oh, that's nice. Uh, we had warm weather up to two weeks ago, and then winter came with our autumn in the middle. But uh, navigating, okay. Nice. Um, <laughs> so I love that you came on the podcast, especially because I do love your book. I had a chance to really read it cover to cover and very interesting. And it's really aligned to everything that I personally um, practice. So I found it great. And it's about adrenal exhaustion, which I also had. So I want to go into that. But um, if people don't know you, because I mean, you kind of became an Instagram sensation, Uh, over the lockdowns by, you know, talking about the science uh, behind everything that was happening, but also spreading a really positive and empathetic message um, that was different from, you know, the camps that kind of built during that time, which is uh, pro con. And it was very frustrating, but you kind of really kept it very level. I think having the beautiful dog in the background of your car really did help. (laughs) Definitely helps. But, you know, uh, it was such a positive thing. Like, I was really looking forward to going on Instagram and seeing the videos because I always thought they were really leveled. Um, So if people don't know you, though, can we give them a little background about your practice and how you even you started doing these videos on Instagram? Yeah, so I went to chiropractic and naturopathic school, which is just west of Chicago, Illinois, called National University of Health Sciences, and then got really far down the rabbit hole of all things holistic. When I went to school, I got really excited. And I was considering med school versus natural medical school, which in the United States is different than other countries. We have naturopathic medical school, and we also have doctors of osteopathy, DOs. So we have NDs, MDs, medical doctors, and DOs. We have like three categories of physicians. And then in many states, doctors of chiropractic, DCs, are also considered primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. So there's And then now there's doctors of physical therapy. So there's a lot of different types of doctors. And I was considering doing the more traditional allopathic mainstream modern medicine MD or DO type approach. But most of the doctors I talked to were not very healthy. They were on oftentimes psychiatric medications or were struggling with mental illness. They were 
oftentimes their wives were raising their kids and they didn't have enough family time or they were divorced and they were really stressed out by the 12 years of medical school and residency and clinicals. And when I talked to every natural medical practitioner, they were super happy, super healthy, super good at work-life balance, had great families, loved their lives, and were just much more positive about it. So I went to that natural medical school um, and just fell in love and started studying everything I possibly could, got into something called applied kinesiology, which is a form of biofeedback, which then led me to acupuncture. It led me to more stress um, and emotional type healing and I basically went to three different schools. Like I was at the chiropractic and naturopathic school, went to the acupuncture school, and then I'm working on finishing five side degrees, two in nutrition, neurology, homeopathy, internal medicine, and applied kinesiology. And so it was more than most anybody in my profession had ever done because I just kind of did only that for about a decade and mm -hmm. kind of came out of that, finishing all the schools, um, having more free time. I decided to write a book. I bought a practice from a Belgian doctor who had been in the States for about 30 years. So I took over his practice so we could move back to Belgium. And then I wrote a book and started a nonprofit right before the pandemic. So I had studied a lot and a lot of the mentors I had were getting amazing, somewhat miraculous results that not a lot of practitioners get. Or in school, they teach us that a lot of these diseases that shouldn't get better, especially chronic diseases would just be a condition that people have forever and they had to take a medication forever or that they would die with certain autoimmune conditions or whatever it be. And so I was seeing this amazing subset of practitioners who are getting really great results by integrating a lot of natural modalities, looking at the whole person. And I wanted to share that with the world. So I started a nonprofit and we were going to be treating lower income and homeless people around Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. And because of the lockdowns, we couldn't really do that. So I went to teaching online and trying to educate people on the message of natural healing, that your body is innately intelligent, that you can heal yourself, that natural immunity is really strong, that we don't have to be in this fear-based paradigm, that sometimes your body does go wrong and it needs a fix and acute accidents happen and modern medicine is amazing. But at the same time, it's not great for promoting health and longevity and quality and quantity of life always. So I started promoting that message. And then right when some of the... Um, the rollout of the injections, the shots started happening. We were doing a lot of blood testing as we normally do on all of our patients on a yearly basis. And we had a few people whose blood work came back abnormal for inflammatory markers, cardiovascular stress markers, plaque risk markers. And we were basically catching some of the myocarditis cases before anybody knew that that was a thing. Mm -hmm. So we were, I was doing my like daily thing, trying to um, do little daily drives to work, talking about what was going on in my life, what was going on during the lockdowns, trying to give people a semblance of hope and positivity and um, just how to be healthy. Because a lot of the message was be afraid, whether it was mm -hmm. be afraid of the germ or be afraid of the shots. A lot of people were just stuck in this like stay at home, be afraid um, and nothing that was really action oriented or taking back your power. Or what can you do on a positive side to be healthy, stay healthy, have a healthy mindset? So we kind of caught some of these cases early of the shot reactions and started studying that, doing pre-post blood tests on people, found that there was actually a much larger percentage of people than people realized that had had these reactions that didn't even notice it. And that's when the account went viral and got deleted at 30,000 followers on Instagram. And then we came back and started teaching just more like people were, it was kind of like the Barbara Streisand effect, which is a phenomenon that happened where someone gets canceled or deleted or a book is labeled as getting burned and then people want it more. So we grew within two months. We were at 90,000 followers. People were like, whoa, why would they delete him? We want to see what he has to say. So grew back to 90,000 followers, got deleted again, and then grew up to like 240,000 followers and then got severely shadow banned last year. Mm -hmm. um, so started another account. Then I was at 100,000 followers. But I think the reason why my account was growing back faster than a lot of other accounts was I was trying to just give truth and not pushing people or telling people what to do one way or the other. But like, here's the evidence. Here's what the research shows. Here's what the science is. Here's what the data is. And letting people make their own decisions, sort of helping guide them through in not out of fear, but saying like, here's what makes the most sense for these type of people or these type of people. Here's what we know about the synthetic community or the natural community. Here's what we know about this variant or that variant. Here's what we know about this new technology that's never been used before. And just explaining it to people in a very um, open, honest way and trying to help people be 
less divisive and spreading more love and community and connection and trying to help people navigate that space was um, a much needed presence in the medical community at that time because a lot of doctors were not allowed to speak out. So a lot of us kind of boldly were like, hey, um, we're really needing like a lot more information than is out there. And people were craving something different. So it was just able to help people navigate the pandemic in a way that was more body positive, more hopeful, more loving, more empowering, and helped a lot of people, I think, learn how to be healthier, how to strengthen their body and their immune system, and how to not just like basics of health that everyone kind of knows. But it was a good opportunity to just re-remind people of the power of lifestyle and how much sleep and good eating and exercise can really impact your immune system. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I completely agree with that. I one of the things that shocked me personally was how and no guideline were guidelines were given about lifestyle. Uh, aside from stay home, be afraid. There was no taking certain vitamins like vitamin D, even going to actually see a doctor and do your blood test to see what your levels even were, um, you know, eating properly, exercising, um, you know, even the relationships you have to have with people like they were just separating everybody so much that everybody got afraid of even talking on the phone almost <laughs> if they could get sick over it. So it was really sh like baffling for me because I have not for a second was afraid of it. And to be honest, I got it. I had a friend visiting uh, last year in November who did get inoculated um, and uh, was traveling all over Germany because he had to go to a medical conference, so he couldn't go unless he got that thing. And um, and then he came here, and I was sick, but I was sick for three weeks. One week, really, that I had flu-like symptoms, and then two weeks, I was just severely fatigued, but I was fine. Like, I, I could cope with life. And I, every day, even through the one week that I was sick, I got up, I fed all the dogs, I, the cats. I, I looked, I like, I did everything I had to do, and then I was just exhausted by the afternoon. But I did it. I was like, you know what? My immune system is strong. I'm just going to get through this. Um, and, you know, I didn't get afraid of it. But the, the one thing that does get you is the t feeling exhausted for a p long period of time. You almost feel like you'll never feel yourself again. And uh, that was like, oh, my gosh, I, I would never want to live a life where I don't have energy. But, you know, and it took me thinking about, wow, how powerful our mitochondria is and how essential it is, right? Because energy, like when you feel fatigued, no matter what you have, that's the main symptoms of all disease. And you just, people don't think about it, but mitochondria need nutrients to get healthier, to be healthy. So it's like, wow, you know, this connection, why didn't anybody make it? And you talked about that on one of your videos, which I really liked. liked. And I thought, great, somebody's talking about it. And then one of my professors, Dr. Ely, who actually is also a naturopath, um, talks about it all the time. And I, I love that there's this movement. Um, but you're right. There was a, a wave of you, uh, natural doctors mostly, and, and then some medical doctors that talked about it. What I noticed that was really scary. And of course, the mainstream will always kind of twist, twist things to make them sound in one one direction, one way. But um, how a lot of doctors didn't even bother reading. I'm talking about local doctors as well. Okay, here, they didn't even bother reading the research. The fact that there was not enough research and they would just parroting a narrative without questioning. That was actually the thing that made me really think, wow, we really needed this paradigm shift. But as you mentioned, you have to do it in a positive way because the more you do it negatively, the more people don't want to listen. So I, yeah, I really appreciated that about you. And I, I completely agree with everything you said because of that. And I want to just segue into your book because you could have written about anything, but you decided to write about <laughs> adrenal exhaustion, which not a lot of people even talk about. And for a long time, it was not a recognized disease. So can you take me through the process of why? And also, if you can go into the mitochondria connection to adrenal disease, I would love that. Adrenal exhaustion. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot. One thing I would say is the book... Um, was just like a much needed book. I feel like there weren't many books on adrenal fatigue that I had personally um, agreed with. The best adrenal fatigue book, I think, was written in the 90s. So it had been a long time since we had a modern day update. And so many of my patients were dealing with chronic adrenal issues or thyroid or other hormonal issues. And I would come and I'd test their blood and their DHEA or their cortisol or testosterone or some of their sex hormones were off. And so I just wanted to write a book that explained what it was and really dive a little bit into 
is it a real thing or not? Because a lot of modern medical doctors, and even today, someone was sending me some people who are like, adrenal fatigue isn't real, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, it actually is real. It's just something like leaky gut. It's like there wasn't a diagnosis for leaky gut 10 years ago. Now there is. There's a marker called Zonio and you can test for it. Um, same thing like probiotics were not considered real science until recently when there was more research on it. So adrenal fatigue is a syndrome that's more like a spectrum. And it's just a very complicated thing. Like any hormonal pattern, there's a lot to it. It's sort of like a whole, your body has a whole hormonal symphony or a whole orchestra with different instruments that are playing. So a lot of people will say that adrenal fatigue is now called burnout, which is an ICD-10 code, which is a little bit more work job related of a code. But there's a diagnosis that's basically similar to adrenal fatigue. They're just classifying with people who are tired of working and they're fatigued. And it's sort of like a mental and physical um, syndrome, which is definitely related to adrenal fatigue. But in traditional medicine, they would call adrenal fatigue Addison's disease, which is, I believe, what JFK had. It's basically where you have almost no adrenal function at all. And on the far other side of the spectrum, you have overfunctioning adrenal glands called Cushing's disease, which is where you have hypercortisol or like a hyper stress reaction. And you get moon face and you get a hump on the base of your neck. And that can happen from taking too many cortisol medication. Um, so if you're taking too much cortisol medication, that can create a pseudo Cushing's type state where your adrenals are in overdrive, or you can have the exact far opposite, but everything in the middle, like that's like the 1% on either side, the other 98% of people who might have a dysfunctional hormonal system or a dysfunctioning adrenal system get missed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people now will call it mitochondrial dysfunction, or they'll call it HPA axis dysfunction. And HPA stands for hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. But those are only three instruments in the orchestra. There's also the thyroid. There's also the gonads. There's also your prefrontal cortex and your midbrain. There's a lot of other feedback loops that all play this large orchestra of how our hormones relate to each other. And the mitochondrial dysfunction comes in because your adrenals help that whole symphony work. And if your overall hormonal system is really happy, then your metabolism is running well and your mitochondria are running at high efficiency. And if they're not working well, if you have certain hormones like thyroid hormone, like adrenaline, like cortisol, like DHEA, um, like epinephrine and um, norepinephrine that are off, then your mitochondria will be underperforming. So it just sort of like lowers your whole body energy. Like when you were sick for a couple of weeks, that's one of the circuits that can be lowered. And a lot of people will say that adrenal deficiency is mitochondrial dysfunction, or they'll say that thyroid deficiency is mitochondrial dysfunction, or overall toxicity or inflammation can cause mitochondrial dysfunction. They'll talk about how stress can cause mitochondrial dysfunction. But the adrenal gland system is a really good system to talk about mitochondrial dysfunction. And they relate very much, those syndromes relate a lot to each other, because the adrenals connect stress to physical health, to hormones, and they do it in such a beautiful way. That's a really great way to view that whole orchestra. Mm. I actually experienced what you're just describing. Um, obviously, it's anecdotal because it wasn't. I wasn't an experiment, but um, I went through a very stressful time just when we moved here because this project that we have in Portugal took the life out of me. But um, I, I was, I basically threw myself in perimenopause. And uh, adrenal fatigue was one of the things that I definitely felt like I knew, but I couldn't get a diagnose, get diagnosis here. I didn't know. Now I have a natural doctor, but at the time I didn't know anyone. And um, I was just not really able to to deal with it. Like, to, you know, I, I took me two years to really get better. Like there was, there was a lot of other things that went, go, were going wrong. Uh, and as you mentioned, hormones, so important because it wasn't just the adrenals and the stress hormones. It was everything like my my estrogen my progesterone was too low it was it wasn't insane um i'm I, i'm actually quite happy and, and surprised that i could reverse everything so quickly in retrospect but um you know it takes a lot of awareness so because it's such a complex syndrome or disease if you want to call it that what are some of the um symptoms that people should look out for that you think, okay, you should really check 
and of course you have this in the book, but if, if people wanted to really make a mental note at home, because sometimes, as you said, they can go to a normal medical doctor and they don't actually consider that they have adrenal fatigue. So how could people check in with themselves? What symptoms should they look for? So the best way to go through remembering the symptoms is remembering the four S's. So your adrenals secrete four different types of hormones. I call the four S's, and that's salt, sex, sugar, and stress hormones. So salt, it secretes a hormone that regulates your salt and blood pressure balance. It's the adrenal gland, which is right on top of the renal gland, otherwise known as the kidney. So it helps regulate blood pressure with your kidneys through salt sodium regulation. It helps regulate sex hormones like DHEA that then helps convert into the other sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone. It helps regulate stress hormones like adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine. So, and then it also helps with sugar and cortisol, which is a sugar and energy type hormone. So if you have variations with energy where it's hard to wake up in the morning or you're tired in the afternoon or it's hard to fall asleep, that could be an adrenal pattern. As far as the sex hormones, it could be low libido or something like PCOS or endometriosis could play a little bit of a role. So different types of hormonal imbalances or low testosterone could be an adrenal type of issue. If it's stress, whether you're anxious, depressed, really stressed out, um, jittery, that can all play a role with adrenals. And um, some of the blood pressure things, especially if sometimes high blood pressure can be hyper adrenal sign. But if you have low blood pressure, that could be, especially when you stand up and you get a little low blood pressure, could be other things like anemia or dehydration. But a lot of times that's a chronic adrenal issue. And so a lot of people who have adrenal fatigue fatigue issues will have fatigue, they'll have sleep issues, they'll have um, energy problems throughout the day where they're up and down rather than a fairly steady energy, they'll crave salt, they'll crave sugar, and they struggle with different hormonal imbalances. What about mood? How, do, how does definitely the mood? Definitely mood. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely mood. It's not the only thing. There's a lot of things that'll cause mood issues, anxiety, depression issues, but a fluctuating mood or blood sugar dysregulation can very much be related to your hormonal system and your adrenal glands. Okay. And so if people found out that, okay, I have actually three or more of these, what, what should they do to test so that they can get an idea? Uh, and what, I mean, at that point, they might have to ask for testing. Uh, so what kind of test should they ask for? Um, so the cheapest way is probably the quiz in the book. Cause I think you get the book yeah. for like $10 on Kindle or something like that. But um, there are ways to test like blood testing might be the cheapest way to do it. You can test your DHEAS, which should ideally be about 100, 200 on most lab ranges, at least in the United States, which I believe is similar to most of Europe. And your testosterone should be in fairly normal ranges for your sex. And cortisol is another good way to check your first morning cortisol. So DHEA, testosterone, and cortisol are the three primary ways to look for it. And then you can also do salivary testing through saliva, through spit. And there's, and that will often be a test where they test two, three, four, five, six times throughout the day to see how your cortisol, one of those hormones, your adrenals secretes, how that fluctuates throughout the day because it should rise up in the morning and slowly taper down before bed so you can have less energy to fall asleep. And then there's also dried urine testing. In Dutch. the U.S., it's called Dutch, Dutch testing, but now Vibrant American and some others are starting to roll that out as well. And that's very helpful as well to test your urinary metabolites for your adrenal hormones. Yeah, that it's also helpful for women um, just to test their hormones as they're going through perimenopause towards menopause. Um, so that's great that they can do that and actually get a full picture, especially if they are in my age, age range in their 40s. Um, so that could be really helpful. What about um, they find out, okay, I have this. What are what are the best first steps they can take at home then? Best first steps are really making sure they're resting, making sure that they're hydrating and salting their food at least a little bit. I think sugar and carbohydrate regulation is very important for your adrenal glands, as is not having too much caffeine. So I always say do your drugs with a purpose, not every day. Too much caffeine will make your body secrete more adrenaline, more cortisol, and create a stress response, which is why when people over-caffeinate, sometimes they'll get anxiety or heart racing type of response. So being very mindful about your caffeine usage, ideally not having every day, is 
quite helpful. And then adding more fat or more protein into each meal, making sure you're having three meals a day can be very helpful. People with extreme adrenal issues do not do very well with intermittent fasting or prolonged fasting because their blood sugar can tank, their blood pressure can tank, their energy can tank if they're not eating. So a lot of people with really severe adrenal fatigue are the people who need to eat more often to keep their blood sugar stable. It's not a diabetic thing. It's just a hormonal blood sugar regulation problem. So that I think the blood sugar and caffeine are really big. Getting enough sleep, ideally seven hours seven and a half to nine hours a night is really helpful. It's not always possible if you have young kids or you're working the night shift, but the more you can get consistent regular sleep is really helpful. And then there's a lot of herbs and supplements that are helpful that practitioners can help with, but things like vitamin B, a good vitamin B complex, ideally a methylated B complex is really helpful. Vitamin D can be really good. There's adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha, rhodiola, schisandra, cordyceps, ginseng, rhodiola. Those are all really helpful. And also um, adrenal glandular extracts when someone's very depleted can also help lift them up, give them a little boost for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Oh, brilliant. And when it comes to exercise, which is part of lifestyle, one thing I've seen in my client's base is that a lot of people obviously feel, and they and rightfully so, their exercise is healthy, but I see that they don't do the right kind of exercise. Can exercise, well, actually, let me rephrase this. What is the best kind of exercise for someone that has adrenal exhaustion? So the best kind would be something that does not tire them out afterwards and is not as intense. So no exercise could create problems. Um, and but over exercising is definitely a problem. So high intensity interval training or really long cardio trainings or really, really heavy weightlifting is going to be the hardest thing for your adrenal system. Something that creates a lot of adrenaline could be too hard on the system when you are in a more of a burnout adrenal fatigue stage. So for those people, there's something called the Maffetone method. So you can Google it, look it up. It's basically a heart rate formula. It's 180 minus your age. So if you're 40 years old, it would be 180 minus 40, which is 140. And that's the top heart rate of where you should be when you're working out. So it's usually you subtract 10 to get 130 to 140 would be like a 40 year old. If you were 50 years old, it would be 180 minus 50. So it'd be 120 to 130. And if you're really chronically sick, then you actually subtract five, 10 points from even that. So the main thing is to not over stress your heart or your adrenaline system while you're doing longer workouts to keep your heart rate lower because if you are training in a very high heart rate that's going to put a little too much stress on your heart a little too much stress on your hormonal system mm. that's interesting and very accurate as well i think because um we don't actually see what happens inside our body long term when we are chronically doing something wrong um what about so actually talking about chronic, something that can go wrong chronically, what, is the, what are the effects of un, unattended um, adrenal fatigue? So what could go wrong long-term if somebody doesn't pay attention? If somebody is very young with it, could be depression, could be anxiety, because um, they're not motivated, they don't have a lot of energy. Not feeling motivated, not feeling like you have a purpose in life could be from really low hormones, but it's kind of chicken and the egg. So low motivation, no purpose in life also gives you no reason to get up and go and get out of bed. And your body will also be controlled by your mind. So your hormones can control your mental health and your mental health can control your hormones too. So some people, they didn't really do a lot to harm their adrenal glands, but they get out of college and they have no purpose or someone died, they went through a major trauma or grief. And so for them, their adrenal issues can be coming from not knowing what the point of life is. But on the opposite side of that, if you are struggling, if you're over caffeinating and burning the candle at both ends, or you've gotten a chronic viral illness and you're recovering from that, then you might not feel a lot of motivation or a lot of purpose because you don't have the energy reserves yet your battery pack is low and you don't have enough mitochondrial energy or hormonal energy to push you through getting you up and out and going and feeling happy. So a lot of people feel just sort of blah or mildly depressed. A lot of people, um, when they're younger, it can show up as infertility or different hormonal issues for women and men. It's showing up as low testosterone for a lot of men as well. The testosterone 
testosterone and sperm count rates are severely declining very rapidly for the entire population. And it shows up as um, issues with sleeping and just kind of like struggling to get through the day for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to, to that when I was going through it, the poor sleeping. And as you said, it's a catch 22 because if you don't sleep well, everything else just is crap. Yeah. So it's not great at all. Um, in terms of um, taking supplements, uh, so there is obviously um, the two camps, even in the medical field, where people are like supplements are not needed and they could be also dangerous for you if you're not taking the right ones. I know the US doesn't have a great regulatory, reg- regulatory, regulatory um, system around uh, supplements, but uh, in Europe, it's a little bit better. Um, but there is, you know, a lot of confusion, basically. So people, when we talk about supplements with them, they are initially a little bit baffled. Also, don't take, they don't know really what brand to choose. So the first thing is, what are the key supplements that people should look at? And the second question would be, when we look at the RDA, for example, um, uh, the RDA that, for example, are advised by government guidelines, in my opinion, they're slightly lower than what we need, especially when people are super deficient. So what should people look at? And also in terms of quantity, do they need to vary from that when they need it? And how do they know? Like, can you test for certain vitamins that are essential? Um, So I think that's probably where it helps to have a practitioner guide you through it because it is very complicated. Some RDAs or the recommended daily amount of vitamins are spot on and others are drastically off. So a lot of people need more vitamin D or more iodine for at least a long period of time than is generally recommended. And if you're trying to treat certain diseases, you might want to mega dose certain things like vitamin A or vitamin C. You can overdo vitamin, your fat soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K. So A, D, E, K, you can actually get toxic from overdosing it. And vitamin A, like in a synthetic medication form, is Accutane, which is really great for acne. So you can also use natural vitamin A, not synthetic vitamin A, that won't hurt your liver, won't be toxic, but you can use high doses for a time to help with acne or to help different lung infections as well. It's very helpful as an antimicrobial for the lungs in viral or bacterial pneumonias. So you can use that. You can use high doses of vitamin C orally or in IV intravenous forms for many, many conditions. So some vitamins... You can do super mega doses all the time. You'll just pee out the excess. That's true of most B vitamins. It's true of vitamin C. Um, A lot of minerals, you'll just poop out the excess. So if you overdo magnesium, you'll definitely get loose bowels. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's hard to, you can sometimes imbalance your electrolyte status with minerals, but you don't have to worry about overdosing minerals as often. Um, But for the RDAs are basically very off for what people need in this day and age because food that contains most of these vitamins and minerals does not generally contain as many nutrients as it used to. There's a lot of research showing the way food is grown, whether it's in soil or water grown hydroponically, whether it's organic or not, whether it's grown in a certain location versus a different location, all of those soil qualities and the type of seed they use and the fertilizer they use can all impact the quality of minerals and vitamins in those foods so yeah it's a very tricky um discussion of like what people need or don't need there are blood tests basic ones and more advanced ones that look at your vitamin mineral status there's something called micronutrient or whole blood cell testing where they look inside the red and white blood cells in your blood to tell you what vitamins are there that can be one of the best ways but certain nutrients it's um it's hard to know there's Mm -hmm. not necessarily you can have a lot of like, even if, if we're talking about minerals or toxic elements, it can be hard to find where they're at. So for instance, I had lead poisoning about a decade ago when I was going through school, I was living in an old 1800s house and you can find lead through hair testing. You can find lead in blood testing. You can find lead through urinary testing. I had it high in all three. Um, and urine, sometimes you need to do a provocation test to find it. But sometimes those toxins or those vitamins are more stored in certain areas of your body, like lead will store in your blood vessels, in your brain, in your bones, especially the bones, but you can't just like take a chunk of someone's bone out. So it can be hard to find these things. So there's no perfect test for 
every toxin or for every mineral. Sometimes you would have to wait till someone's dead to like biopsy parts of their body to see how much is in there. And there's no great standard yet exactly on how high a lot of these nutrients need to be. Blood testing is the typical way that most people do them, but some of them, um, it's hard to know whether it's the red blood cell that has the quantity or your saliva or the white blood cell or blood or urine or hair. So there is a lot of debate in the natural health community about how to test for these things. But generally, um, even if you don't have low levels um, or you're not finding low levels, I think taking a multivitamin or just eating a really good diet most for a part, eating, taking a multivitamin like a couple times a year is usually good for most people because it can still benefit you in a way um, that you're not getting um, from your food for most everybody. And um, they can also generally um, just focus on eating the cleanest, best sources of food that they can. That's more seasonal, that's more local and rotating their foods over time. A lot of people actually get selectively nutrient deficient because they're eating the same thing for breakfast every day. Or they're just kind of going because we have the ability internationally to get the same fruit year round or get the same vegetables year round or get the same meat year round. People are eating the same thing all the time. So one of the most important, it's not like the coolest, newest, um, like biohacking technique, but one of the best things you can do is eat locally and eat what's in season and rotate your foods at least seasonally. So you can get different nutrient value from your food. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes up to when it comes to brands, how do people know if a brand is reliable? Well, we have a online store that has um, brands that are vetted and every country sort of has its own standards. The U.S. has something called CGMP or Certified Good Manufacturing Practices, which says that the government once in a while will check out those companies and make sure that the companies have what it says it has in the supplement. So basically, every time you're getting that bottle, it has the same type of stuff in it. Mm. Because otherwise, you might have a bottle that has a lot of active ingredient and then another bottle or a couple of pills that don't have a lot of active ingredient. So it's basically standardizing, saying, okay, every pill is the same. And the tricky part, which is what a lot of um, conventional docs will say is bad about the supplement industry or their herbal industry, is that there aren't a lot of quality control checks that are good enough. Some companies do really good quality control checks and other companies do not. And there's a lot of different standards um, internationally and locally of what's accepted. But basically, you're looking for companies that will test every batch of raw ingredient that they're receiving. Most of the times when a supplement company receives a shipment of vitamins or herbs or minerals, they'll get a certificate of analysis from the place that's selling it to them. And then they get that big box or the big bin of raw material. They change that into little pills or tablets or liquid form and then combine it to sell it through their product. But not many companies will retest that certificate of analysis to see what toxins or what heavy metals or what pesticides are in their product. So some companies will test every single batch. Some companies will test once a month. Some companies won't test at all. And the, the most nefarious part is that a lot of the companies that do test every batch when they get products that are not up to their standards they don't send them all the way back to china where a lot of the raw materials come from they don't send them all the way back to the farm that it comes from the farm will send it to another supplement company that they know is not going to test so the low quality stuff that's contaminated gets in some of the brand name like cheap supplements that you can find at your local supermarket or that is maybe 10 bucks versus 30 bucks. So generally when you're paying more, you're getting more. Some MLMs and some people in that industry, that's not always true. There are some brands that are really expensive, but not good quality. But for the most part, if you're getting your supplements through a practitioner who does their due diligence or that has supplements that have more of these CGMP or more standards where governments are approving those things like Australia and New Zealand has pretty good quality control checks, then you know you're getting better quality stuff. If you ask um, different pharmacists, when I was living in Ireland, like they have some pharmacists have a really good knowledge of this as well. So you can just start up the conversations with your practitioners, with pharmacists, with stores that are selling it and see what their knowledge is of these companies. Yeah, good idea. And is it important then, considering that some of them might have pesticides and might have residues of um, heavy metals, 
do you think it's important to go for at least certified organic um, so that, you know, you know that at least the pesticides part should be kind of taken care of? In general, yes. If you're able to get something that way, that's great. Some of the vitamins don't actually come from real stuff or like they don't come from the ground or plants. So certain things yes. like vitamin C, ascorbic acid can be derived from corn or there are certain like um, bacteria or yeast or funguses that'll actually um, get an extract of vitamins from that. So different B vitamins can come from like yeast cultures and things like that. So some of them can't be organic because of that process, especially certain synthetic vitamins. But there's also um, some things that are just in such high demand that we don't have enough organic ma raw material to go around. So a good example of that is different glandular materials by a company Standard Process, where they'll, they produce a lot of the United States' supplements for chiropractors and natural healthcare providers. And they have extracts of thyroid gland that help people with thyroid issues. But they go through 3 million thyroids a year you know, because they're just using that much raw material. They're selling that many vitamins and supplements. But there's not 3 million grass-fed organic cows in the United States or in the world to supply that demand. So they're using more thyroid than there are organic cows. So there is a little bit of a supply and demand issue. But if you can get the highest quality stuff, the more organic stuff that is going to help you, probably more. But... What I've found is that people's bodies are generally trying to do the best they can. So even if you can't get like the most top tier thing, most people's bodies will are innately intelligent and will take what they can to get better. So it's like you don't have to do the exact perfect thing to heal. If you get, you know, a vitamin C that's maybe not the best, maybe it's not from like amla or maybe it doesn't have rose hips or it doesn't have all the bioflavonoids that a whole food like camu berry vitamin C has, but you're still, you're getting ascorbic acid from corn. People's bodies will still use that ascorbic acid to help them heal. So it's not as um, good as some other sources of vitamin C, but it's still going to take what it can and benefit from it as much as it can to help it get better. I understand that and it makes sense. But one question came to me as you were talking about where you could get ascorbic acid from and mostly being corn. Is that a danger then of it being GMO? Um, potentially, yes. No one's entirely sure. I think if you're extracting just the ascorbic acid, you're probably safe um, from a biochemical Newtonian physics standpoint. But from a quantum physics standpoint, the energetics, if you're into that sort of realm, are likely pretty off. So it's sort of next level when you start talking about like, what's what about the energy of the plant? What about the energy of the food? Um, and how could that possibly relate to what you're eating? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm just thinking if we don't want pesticides and with something like GMO, you'll definitely have things like glyphosate. So not great. And, uh, yeah. you know, then on top of that, of course, the energetic, like the intention then goes into this monocropping. It's definitely going to bring it to the next level. Um, you mentioned that for um, glandular kind of support, you need to have like a thyroid, you have to have it from animals. What about for people that are plant-based and vegan, what options do they have to support those uh, glands so they don't have, without the cruelty involved, because obviously for people like me <laughs> that don't mm -hmm. want to consume animal products, um, what would be the best option? Um, well, there are other options. Sometimes it can be slower depending on the condition, but there's a lot of other nutrients and minerals and things that could help that are plant-based or not, um, that are vegan or vegetarian or an not animal-based. So there's things like flaxseed and B6 um, can help your thyroid. There's things like um, bladder rack and ashwagandha and tyrosine and um, iodine and selenium making sure you have enough iron that can all help your thyroid as well. There's different homeopathic remedies that can stimulate a healing response in your thyroid as well that are not animal-based. So you'd go towards more vitamin minerals, making sure the thyroid has everything it needs, and then probably going towards more of a homeopathic way to boost your thyroid as well. Brilliant. And when it comes, you mentioned heavy metals. So obviously we know those are very important and I guess they could alone possibly create a problem with our adrenal glands as they do with things like liver what about um, our environmental exposures? Because obviously we know we don't live in a clean environment wherever we are on the planet. 
um, what is the best thing that we can do to kind of tackle that? Because we are getting sprayed on day in and day out. So we don't have control over that, whether we want to admit it, realize it or not. So one supplement, I guess, that works well for that is N-acetylcysteine. Mm -hmm. The United States kind of made that hard for consumers to get during the pandemic, um, which was tough. But NAC, N-acetylcysteine, can be really helpful for most people between like 500 to 2,000 milligrams of that a day for adults can be something to ask your practitioner about. Um, so that can help supporting your liver through just a really healthy diet to make sure it's not you're not having a super inflammatory diet or not consuming tons of caffeine, especially a lot of alcohol could inhibit your liver's ability to function as well. But if you're peeing and pooping and sweating and breathing, you're supporting your liver, like you're detoxing all the time. And one of the best ways is through exercise that heats your body up to sweat. So if you're exercising, getting warm and hot and sweaty, that's really helpful. It's kind of like you're creating your own infrared sauna, which is another really useful tool. So infrared saunas are different than a regular sauna because it heats you inside out like exercise. So really intense exercise, you'll detox some of that internal toxicity out through your pee, through your bowel movements, through sweating. And if you're not able to do that, or if you want even more benefit, infrared saunas have been shown to excrete toxins as well. A lot of people who say there's no research to that just haven't read enough research. They're basically like reading the research written by the pharmaceutical companies, not reading the actual research that's there. Sort of like there's, and the tricky part about research is there's research for and against everything. So they might research 20 people who did an infrared sauna, but it was not a great quality sauna and they didn't have lead toxicity. So no lead came out of their skin. Whereas they researched like 20 people who had lead toxicity or who were just normal people and they did it far infrared sauna and they found heavy metals and lead coming out of their skin. So a lot of this research, you have to be a little um, more astute to read and make sense of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when it comes to overall health, we know that the gut is super important and I'm guessing the adrenals are no difference, They're no different. So when it comes to probiotics, what's your take on them? Because there are doctors that think that taking probiotics is a great idea. Other think it's really not that great, great of a deal and you can just eat a good diet full in fiber. So the prebiotics will then populate your, your well, feed your bacteria so they can repopulate your gut. Yeah, what's your, what's your take on that? Um, well, two main things. One thing I guess to say first is that your body is always king or queen. So like if you took a probiotic and you're like, oh, that did not feel good or I had diarrhea for days then probably don't do that. So these are just like general suggestions for people to learn from. But the other thing is that so if your doctor's telling you like, no, this must be right. And you're like, every time I take it, I'm psychotic, which happens a lot to my patients with statins, because if your cholesterol drops too low, you can get a psychotic break, which I've had multiple patients have happen or they get like muscle joint fatigue, but they'll start hallucinating, which is really scary for them. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful not to overdo the dose of your statin or but if you're having an experience that's negative and everyone says like vitamin D3 is the best thing ever and you're taking it with K2 and with magnesium in a low dose and every time you take it, you can't sleep or you're getting some sort of problem, then your body is the most important. So like if you're reacting, just don't take it. Make sure like you're listening to yourself more than any practitioner is one key takeaway I want to mention. The other one um, is basically that probiotics are kind of like adopting a dog from the shelter. So you could get a random dog from the shelter and they might be a good guard dog. They might be a good people dog. They might be a good dog loving dog that like gets along with their dogs. They might not get along with their dogs, but they're all every breed's going to have a slightly different purpose. And different probiotic strains have different purposes as well. So the general two are lactobacillus acidophilus and bifidobacter. Those are the two most common probiotic strains that are used. And if you're using those, you're generally going to like a shotgun approach or like getting a random dog. There's going to be benefit. They're going to probably make your life better. You're going to probably love the dog. Um, not always, but most people will. And they're going to be anti-inflammatory for your gut. They're going to signal different immune um, components that are likely going to benefit your immune system. So those two are generally safe to take. And there's a lot of good companies that supply those. The ones I personally use are usually Metagenics, Orthomolecular Labs, Microbiome Labs, and Claire Labs. I find do really get really great results for my patients. But um, they all have different varieties and strains and breeds, basically, of probiotics that are useful. But for most people who are eating just like a standard type diet, 
a general probiotic to take maybe half the time or through fall, winter, spring can support their immune system, can help with some anti-inflammatory for their gut. And you can also eat your probiotics as well. So you could eat fermented foods like pickles and sauerkraut and kimchi. And you can also make your own probiotics. There's ways to make probiotics from rice milk where you can have tons of lactobacillus acidophilus, like billions and billions of um, counts of that probiotic. And it's a lot cheaper than buying an expensive supplement too. So you can learn to make your own kombucha, which has some decent um, probiotics. Though I do find for the kombucha lovers that if you overdo kombucha, sometimes people get a little too much yeast um, mm -hmm. than bacteria and that can create problems. But um, rice milk and other probiotics and kefir and things like that can be really helpful for people to do on their own to support that um, without having to buy a supplement. No, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I only really ever found one company in the UK that I personally react very well to. The others that just don't do anything for me. Um, I started There's taking a lot it of that. Up, yeah. And I started taking that after having, I mean, I, I was constipated for like 20 years of my life because my parents, every single year, they would give me antibiotics when I was a child. So that created chaos. And then um, then I, I had eating disorders when I was younger. So I, I just wasn't regular until, and I had IBS. So I really, I, I was looking for something to help me. And aside from changing the diet and really getting, you know, working on a good relationship with food, I started working on different kind of probiotics that would help me or not. And at the beginning, I took this really random, random uh, brand in the UK that I found at Boots, which is like a, a pharmacy. Yeah. And, no you know, yeah, because we were in Ireland. Um, and I was just, I, you know, it worked. But, like, it wasn't great, but it worked a little bit. And then I started looking into it and really learning the science. And I became friends with the owners of uh, oh, the reps of um, OptiBac, which is a UK company. And they freeze dry the probiotics so that they last longer. And, and I personally tried them. I was like, okay, I'm no expectation. I'm going to just try them. For me, they work like a charm. And then I would take something completely different if I ran out of that. And it would be like, what? This is nothing, nothing. I feel it's not, it feels like nothing. I just spent 40 euro. What the heck? And then, <laughs> so yeah, yeah so I, I think he's right. Like you have to definitely engage with your body, what your reaction is to those things. And um, so that you know if it works for you or not. It's really uh, that simple, really, at the end. Um, but yeah, it's a funny thing, but you know, the best is to make them at home. And of course, eating a diet that is rich in probiotics and prebiotics, um, to feed the, the guys, otherwise they kind of die yep. anyway. So, right. Though when you've had lots of antibiotics, a lot of times you do need supplemental probiotics to really help you get over that hump. And yeah. like you said, like you find the right one and it can be magical. And then most of them you're like, this is nothing. This is nothing new. Yeah. I mean, in the 80s, I guess probiotics were not a thing when my parents weren't giving me all that stuff. So they didn't know. <laughs> I was like, right. okay, well, I just constipated, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Poor kid. Anyway, so um, what about medicinal marijuana and, um, and adrenal exhaustion? Um, in the US, we know a lot of states uh, made it legal to have it. Um, in Europe, you kind of can go to places where you can have it. Not so legally, but sometimes it is. And um and it's just this thought about it being really helpful for some people. And we know for things like cancer, it could be very helpful. But for somebody with adrenal fatigue, I mean, if you're taking something like a sativa that is very relaxing and could make you even you know, less energetic, what could the synergy be? And is there a way to take things like medicinal marijuana in a, in a conscious way when you have adrenal exhaustion? It's better not to touch it. So it's probably... It could be helpful or harmful for most everybody. It's going to be pretty terrible for their adrenals. I hate to tell you that, but mm -hmm. for people who are big marijuana users. Um, but for most people, it's not going to be helpful, especially if they're doing it daily or if they're overdoing it or doing it all day. That can be the worst for your adrenals. So people who are chronic smokers, especially people who are like high all the time or high multiple times a day, they tend to end up with adrenal exhaustion. Um, but if you can't sleep and you're using CBD, CBD is fine, but THC can cause major issues for your hormonal and nervous system. And that, so if you can't sleep and you need THC to sleep, then that's probably going to be better than not sleeping for your adrenals. But over time, that could create a subtle issue. 
but I find it's typically the daily users or the more than once a day users just for sleep who are having the biggest struggles because it does sort of lower, does sedate you a little bit. It does lower motivation, does affect dopamine systems. Dr. Daniel Amon and others have shown on brain scans that it's not good for your brain long term. So it's much better, I think, than alcohol. It's much better than having like five energy drinks a day, but it's not the best way to be. Um, again, it's like why I say don't do your drugs every day, do them with a purpose. Um, it's unfortunately, though it has anti-cancer benefits, though I, I have patients who need it for seizures and epilepsy and stuff like that, it does have some consequences. And I believe when your body truly needs it, it's likely going to have less negative consequences. But if you're using it without a strong intention or without a strong purpose, you're just using it recreationally or you're just getting high all the time using it in that aspect, then it's likely to have more negative consequences for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to mention CBD. I'm happy you brought it up because that's something that is more in my realm. I, I think CBD can be very helpful. I use it sometimes for inflammation, especially with turmeric. My, my friends have a beautiful mm -hmm. brand here in uh, Europe. Um, and it's made with, it's, window, it's called Window Workshop and they, they make everything really organically. They know the source, they work with the farmers. And uh, when they started making the CBD, one of the thing the important thing to them was it to make it right. Uh, so I think, I believe they do uh, oxygen extraction and, um, and they basically mix it with the turmeric because that's what the brand was initially created for, like with, with the turmeric. And I find it really helpful. You know, I even give it to my dogs if they have some problems with joints and they seem to react really well to it. But yeah, I, I was wondering about marijuana because I know in the US it's a huge thing. It's huge business. Um, and of course, you know, people that do smoke and love to smoke will always say, oh, but it's therapeutic. And then there is definitely a difference between therapy and uh, recreation. So that's something to really be aware of, right? Right. So in your opinion, if somebody, before we close, I know you have to go, so I'm not going to keep you too long, but um, what, if you had to define health, what would that be for you? Like if you have to say, somebody was like, what does healthy mean? I think it means being in harmony with your environment. So you're in a complete state of physical, mental, emotional balance with the environment around you so you're can generally healthy you would be like mentally well physically well and capable and able to um be in your environment and not rely on drugs or medications you could rely on just the natural world around you to be well mm. And right. a lot, a lot of people, I just want to add one point because yeah, a lot of people please. get this wrong. They think that they have to be perfectly balanced, but perfect balance is really boring. Like when we think <laughs> in Chinese medicine, like if your meridians and your elements and everything was balanced, you'd probably be monotone. You'd be super boring. You wouldn't be too excited. You wouldn't, you'd sort of be like people who are on too many psych medications. You'd just be sort of like flatlined and you'd be living this dull gray type of life. But we need people who are slightly imbalanced. We need some people who are occasionally, like it's normal to be angry, it's normal to be sad, it's normal to be really happy, it's normal to be not very happy, it's normal to be scared, it's normal to be excited, it's normal to have some adrenaline, it's normal to have times where you're bored. And so I think we need a variety of life and think about health more as harmony rather than pure balance. So if your life is working for you and you're growing and you're changing and you're um, fitting in with your environment in synergy and harmony, then that is health. If you're perfectly balanced, you're probably boring and not that healthy. Yeah, that's a good call. And, you know, I was expecting you to say balance and I'm happy you clarified <laughs> that because, you know, everybody's like being in balance. And sometimes I, I guess I use it too, especially when I teach yoga, because we're trying to get to the place where we're not too fiery not too airy not too grounded but and be like right in the middle where we can function but at the same time you're right like we have these ups and downs i mean that's human being human have those emotions right. and as you and said growing yeah i think it's normal to be if someone punches in the face you don't want to be like mm, i'm fine do it again like <laughs> you know it's yeah. like it's that's a healthy righteous anger when it's going to help you so, yeah absolutely <laughs> that's <yeah>. great <laughs> okay last question i have to ask you this because you have a beautiful dog and i have pets and so do you feel that having animals 
has a huge positive impact on our health. For sure. Yeah. I think it helped a lot of my followers <laughs> have a good time too. Um, just relax. I think it's very relaxing. Their saliva, I think, is shown to be more effective than an antidepressant. So like let them lick you a little bit or lick your hand or something like that. Um, but their flora, their energy, it gives you purpose. It gives you structure in your life. When people are very depressed, one of the best things they can do is have structure. Or when you're ill too, one of the best things you can do is like wake up and go to sleep at the right time. And Dogs, especially, have to take out and they give you structure, they give you love. And at the end of the day, I think the biggest deficiency most people have is either of fun or love. We're just deficient mm -hmm. in our heart. And CBD fuels both of those pathways, but we really need more fun. We need more love. And pets have lots of love to give us. Oh, yes, they do. All right, that's a great way to end the conversation. Thank you so, so much for sharing all the nuggets. I really appreciate it and love the, the talk. And yeah, thanks for your work. Keep on going. Keep the books coming. I don't know if you have, I probably don't have time to write as much, but if you can, you have a beautiful way of writing in a way that is understandable and clear. Because sometimes you read these books, especially about diseases that are so complex that by the end, you just feel like you have 10 more diseases that you haven't figured out yet, you know? <laughs> so this is really, really easy. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Anytime. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. And thank you everyone for staying on for this episode. I hope you got a lot out of the golden nuggets that Dr. Brad has shared. I really loved having this conversation. The book is great and all the links for his practice and the book are in the show notes. Okay, in the meantime, please do like, share and review the podcast so that you can help us grow. And I will see you next week. <laughs>